Hey, this is Joshua Fowler. I just wanted to come to you this weekend, and it's such an honor to do so, to minister to all of my friends and family at Legacy, Awake SA, Awake Johannesburg, Awake Orlando, Awake Dallas, and Awake the World, and all of our friends that are joining us from all over via YouTube, via Facebook. Thank you so much for this opportunity to share the Word of God. Let's pray. Father, thank you for these next few minutes as we gather around your word that we are changed into your image from glory to glory. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. We want to get in the word today and we're starting a brand new series called The Power of Prayer. Prayer changes things. You know, I heard one time, you know, prayer not only changes things, it changes us. It changes me. So as we get into this series, I pray that the Lord will just minister to you and help you to go from glory to glory, dimension to dimension, faith to faith, strength to strength in your prayer life. We're going to talk about the power of prayer at least the next four or five weeks, and I believe you're going to be blessed. Today, I want to get into the Word of God, and just before I do so, I want to share with you an encounter I had not long ago in the presence of the Lord. This encounter just absolutely wrecked me, changed me. It moved me into another dimension of understanding the power of our prayers. Years ago, the Lord began to show me things in heaven, things that were taking place. As many of you know, he's given me open visions and dreams, and I give him the glory for that. But recently, uh, since this pandemic, in the middle of a, a time with the Lord, the Lord showed me something that changed me. He gave me an open vision. In this open vision, there was this ark that was uh, come around the throne of God, and it came down into the earth, and it would form an ark into different places. And he spoke to me. He showed me this being that was... Um, it was like an eagle, but it was like a man. It's what you see in Revelations chapter four and in different places through scripture when Ezekiel prophesied, he had a face of a lion, a face of an eagle, a face of a man, a face of an ox, representing the fivefold ministries in the earth through these four beings. As you see in Ephesians chapter four, it says, and he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and then pastors and teachers are not separated with a comma. They are, uh, all pastors should be teachers, but all teachers are not pastors. We can talk about that in another series about the fivefold, but these fivefold images, these fivefold ministry gifts are uh, expressed through these four beasts that are around the throne that we see in the in Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 1 verses 10 and 11, and in, then also in Revelations chapter 4. You see these beasts, uh, the, the lion, the, the eagle, the ox, and the man. So the lion represents the apostolic, the eagle represents the prophetic, the ox represents the evangelistic, and the man represents the pastor and teacher who are helping to represent the kingdom to mankind. And so you see them in the face of the man. And so in this vision that I received, this, this uh, being that was like an eagle, but he was a man, he uh, came down wherever this ark would come together in the earth, and he would take his talons and join them together like a it would fly down, swoop down, and it would grab the, the point of this intersection of where uh, this ark met in cities and nations around the world. And then poof, like reverberation of the power of God, awakening, revival, the move of God would just break out. Healing, signs, wonders, miracles, breakthroughs would take, take place all through that region. A mass harvest of souls everywhere this ark met. And he told me to tell his people, he said, this, I will meet you at the intersection of intercession. Glory to God. I will meet you at the intersection of intercession. So he said, where the intercession of the saints meets with heaven, where that point is connected. He said, I will join. And that's where this angel, this being, this, this 
one that's sent to release awakening and revival in the earth joins together those that intersection and revival and awakening takes place. Wow. Boy, I feel his presence even as I talk about it now. And then he said, tell my people, I will meet you on the corner of worship and intercession, where your worship and intercession meet. Literally, like if you were driving through town and you told people, I want you to meet me here and here in Johannesburg or in Orlando or maybe in Dallas. I want you to meet me at such and such corner. He said, tell my people at the corner, at the intersection of their worship and their their prayer, their their intercession. He said, at that intersection, I will meet you and I'll release the move of my spirit. And so this encounter totally changed me. It began to show me how heaven is waiting for our prayer. Heaven is waiting for our worship. So we're going to talk about the power of prayer, the power of intercession. That intersection of intercession is what God is looking for to us to create in the earth, a place in the earth when we pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. When we pray that prayer, heaven meets earth and there's a change, glory to God. So let's get in the word today and let's look at what God has to say about this. Go with me, if you will, in your Bible to James chapter 5 and verse 16. James chapter 5 and verse 16. Let's look at the word of God today concerning prayer. Now, this is a powerful passage of scripture. I'm reading from the New King James Version uh, this time, but let's look at it. Uh, why don't we even back it up a little bit? Verse 13, is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Glory to God. Now he goes on, verse 16. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Now look at this. This is powerful. He says, pray for one another so that you will be healed. So in your praying, for your brothers and sisters in Christ, you are healed. Sometimes we are waiting for someone to come pray for us when in fact there's a miracle in our mouth. There's healing in our mouth. There's breakthrough in our mouth. If we'll go and pray for someone else and minister to someone else, then we can be healed. Some people say, well, I just need to wait until everything's perfect in my life and then I'll be able to minister to people. No, now, now you don't want to live in sin and live a lie, but you, once you've confessed your sins, once you've given your life to Christ, you need to begin to immediately go and give away what you've received. Glory to God. You need to go and give away that anointing. You need to touch somebody else, minister to somebody else, and watch and see what he'll do in and through your life. Now, he said, the effectual fervent prayer of the righteous man avails much. The Passion Translation reads like this. Confess and acknowledge how you have offended one another. This is James 5, 16 in the Passion Translation. Confess and acknowledge how you have offended one another. And then pray for one another to be instantly healed. For tremendous power is released through the passionate heartfelt prayer of a godly believer. Oh, glory to God. For tremendous power is released through the passionate, heartfelt prayer of a godly believer. The effectual, fervent prayer of the righteous avails much. So that lets me know that there's a kind of prayer that prevails. There's a kind of prayer that gets results. There are kinds of prayers that are weak. But there are kinds of prayers that avail much. There are kinds of prayers that hit the mark. I don't know about you, 
but I want to pray a prayer that hits the mark. I don't know about you, but I want to pray a prayer that gets the job done. I don't want to pray, as the Apostle Paul says, as one who's beating at the air. I don't want a war as one who's just fighting around me that don't know, you know, which way did he go, George? Which way did he go? I don't want to, I don't want to pray like that. I want to pray a prayer that packs a punch, that has power, that hits the mark. Glory to God. And that's the kind of prayer that God's going to raise up on the inside of you and me. A prayer that has power. The power of prayer. Now you need to know that prayer is your oxygen. Prayer is the oxygen to your fire. A fire will go out without oxygen. Your fire, your life, your passion, it will go out without prayer. Prayer is the oxygen of your life. You need prayer like you need oxygen. You need prayer like a fish needs water. You need prayer like you, anyone needs air to breathe. You need prayer. This is what you need, the power of prayer. I'm reminded of this story that my granddaddy told me years ago. There was this young man who said that, uh, that he needed God, that he wanted God. And so this guy took him out in the water and said, how bad do you want? He said, I want him. I want him more than anything. So he took this, this child and the best I can remember the story, he took this young man and he threw him under the water and, and he wasn't baptizing him either. He brings him up out of the water. He says, how bad do you want God? How, how much do you want him? And, and the boy says, I want him so much. He said, no, you don't understand what I'm saying. He took the, the young man, held him under the water and, and held him there. And the guy was violently trying to get up from out from under the water. He held him there a little bit longer. Bubbles were coming up from the water. He brought him back up. He said, how bad do you want the Lord? How bad do you want God? He says, you're trying to kill me. You're trying to kill me. He, he took him again, threw him under the water. He gets up, he brings him up out of the water. He says, how bad do you want him? He said, stop, you're trying to kill me. He says, what did you want more than anything when you were, when you were under that water? He says, I wanted you to let me up so I could breathe. He says, he says, that's it. He says, when you want God more than you want the air that you need to live, to breathe, that's when you'll have God. That's what our prayer life is. Our prayer life is a desire, a hunger that we have to have him more than anything. We must have God. It's not, a, it's not an app on the phone that we can get away with or not. It's not something that's, that's, a, that's a, you know, maybe, and a maybe, but it's a necessity. I, we have to have God, so we have to pray. Prayer is the oxygen of our life with God. It's our communion, our communication with God. Over these coming weeks, you're going to hear from Pastor Greg. You're going to hear from uh, Pastor Jesse. You're going to hear from myself again about the, the power of prayer. But listen, if you only listen to this and are a hearer of the word, you're not going to see the results. You must be a doer of the word. Do what the word says. Do what we're teaching you today. The effectual fervent prayer of the righteous man avails much. He said, he said, it's for tremendous power is released through the passionate heartfelt prayer of a godly believer. Now he said the effectual fervent prayer. Fervent means to the boiling point. That's what it means to have a prayer life that is to the boiling point, a prayer life that's not just, just get you by, that's not just a little dab of do you, not a lukewarm prayer, but a prayer that is red hot, full of passion to the boiling point. You know, uh, prayer needs to be like what you know in South Africa, it needs to be hot. Now I brought here with me today this that many of you will know in the UK and in South Africa and America, we're coming to an understanding of this, this kettle. I love this kettle. Uh, you can heat water up in it. Now in America, when you heat the water up, you heat it up to what we call 212, 212 degrees 
Fahrenheit. And then those of you in South Africa, uh, you, you heat it up to what you call Celsius 100. And when, you're, when you heat up this water to 100, you know, keeping it 100, as you would say there, my friends, in South Africa, when you get it to 100, then you can have a proper glass of tea. That's what we talk about, a proper glass. You know, some of that good old Royal Boys tea. I know you say it different ways throughout South Africa. I get corrected all the time. It's Roy Boys. It's Roy Boys. It's Roy Boys. I don't know. But anyhow, you know what I'm talking about. You can get a proper glass of tea. Maybe if you're watching from England, the UK, uh, you, you get a proper glass of British tea. Uh, in America, you might want to get a glass of Lipton tea, uh, some mint tea. I don't know what your flavor is, but you cannot have a proper glass of tea without heating up that water to the boiling point. So it is with your and my eye prayer life. When we pray, our prayer life has to be heated up to that place of the boiling point. He said, the effectual fervent prayer of the righteous man avails much. So a prayer that is lukewarm will not avail much. A prayer that is cold and indifferent will not avail much. You said, Joshua, why do you get so passionate when you preach? Why are you so passionate when you pray? Why do you get so passionate? Well, it's because that is the kind of prayer that avails much. A passionate prayer is a prayer of power. I can have the power of prayer revealed in and through my life when I pray passionately. So you want your prayer life to be heating up just like we're seeing this kettle heat up this water right now. We want our prayer life to get to 100 Celsius, to 212 uh, in Fahrenheit. Now, if you were to watch a train, there are trains that are literally that are moved forward by steam, steam engines. These, this steam is heated up to the boiling point. Well, that same train, if it's at 211 or if it's at 99 Celsius or 211 uh, Fahrenheit, you, that train will go nowhere. You can load it up with all of its carts. You can have it all ready and it can get hot enough to burn you, but it will not be hard enough to move you. This is the way many people live their life and their prayer life. They live one degree beneath the boiling point. They live one degree beneath that 100 uh, Celsius or that 212 Fahrenheit. And they wonder why they're not going anywhere. Well, I just want to submit to you that you need to bring it up another degree. Look at your neighbor across your house right now, if you're watching online or if you're in the house there at, at Legacy at Awake Johannesburg or Awake Orlando, look right now at that. Look at your neighbor and say, oh, come on, get it heated up another degree. Come on. Come on, take it up another notch. I remember, I remember we used to watch uh, uh, one that, that brother that would teach, that chef that would teach. He would say, bam, kick it up another notch. You need to kick it up another notch. One more degree, one more degree. Turn to somebody, say one more degree, one more degree, one more degree. Yell across the house, one more degree. You're watching online, you know, send us a message, say one more degree. You need to take your prayer life one more degree higher. If you're at 99, take it to 100. If you're at 211, take it to 212. Now that same steam engine, if you add one degree and get it to 212 Fahrenheit, 100 Celsius, that train train will start to move it. Choo, 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 and whoo, and you'll see the steam start coming up out of the top of that choo-choo train and that train will begin to move and what once was at a dead standstill will begin to move forward and carry thousands of tons of weight, cars and, and food and people. It'll carry them from one place to its destination. Do you want to get to your destination? Do you want to get, do you want to see your destiny fulfilled? Heat it up one more degree. Cause your prayer life to come up to the boiling point. And when you do, choo, 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 
You're going to begin, you're going to begin to move forward and faster and faster and faster. You talk about apostolic acceleration. You talk about prophetic precision. As you begin to release passionate prayers, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man will begin to avail much. You'll begin to go from glory to glory and grace to grace and strength to strength. And just like you can see right here in this, in this kettle, you're going to begin to boil. You're going to begin to come up higher and higher. Your prayers will begin to hit the mark and you'll begin to be moved forward into your destiny. Glory to God. This is what's happening right here. It's happening in you, in your prayer life, in your home. Come on, when you walk the floor, when you pray, when you begin to pray in the spirit, that prayer, I, I don't know if you can see it right here, but you can. I can see the 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 uh the the incense excuse me i can see the steam rising right now from this kettle can you see it it's rising that that steam is rising that's what your prayers do your prayers begin to rise and ascend before the throne and he answers those prayers he will receive those prayers he will fulfill those prayers when they're red hot yep I love that sound. It just clicked. It means it's tea time. It's ready. Can you see it? Your prayers are to the boiling point. Passionate, red hot prayers to the boiling point. They avail much. Those prayers begin to arise before the throne. Revelations chapter five and verse eight helps us to see this, that our prayers are literally like sweet smelling incense that rises before the throne. Just like what you're seeing right here. Just like this steam that rises. When your prayers are fervent, they rise. Your prayers that are fervent rise. Come on, they can't rise before his throne if they're not passionate, if they're not hot. Revelations 5 and verse 8 says, the moment he took the scroll, the four animals and the 24 elders fell down and worshiped the lamb. Each had a harp and each had a bowl, a gold bowl filled with incense, the prayers of God's holy people, a gold bowl filled with incense, the prayers of God's holy people. Think about that. These 24 elders each have golden bowls and our prayers the prayers of the saints, when we begin to pray passionately, fervently, when we begin to pray in the name of Jesus to our Father God, those prayers begin to boil. They begin to arise as sweet smelling incense and those golden bowls that those 24 elders are holding, those golden bowls are filled with the prayers of the saints like sweet smelling incense. And that incense arises to the throne of grace. It arises. This is why you and I must pray prayers that are passionate. We must pray fervent prayers. My beloved, all around the world, my friends and family at Legacy, at Awake SA, at Awake Johannesburg, my friends, and family at Awake Orlando, at Awake Florida, and Awake America, and Awake the World. Those of you that are joining us from all over via Facebook, via YouTube, however you're watching this today at awaketheworld.org or at your church's website today, know this, that God is looking for a people who will not just pray, now I lay me down to sleep prayers, He's looking for a people that will not just peacefully coexist with what they see going on in the world around them. Come on, if you're going to change the government of your nation, if you're going to change the laws of the land, if you're going to change things that are going wrong in your nation, then you must pray fervently. It reminds me of Daniel. He prayed passionately three times a day. He prayed and they, they threatened him and they even instituted laws that they knew that would harm him. The king did not want this. Nebuchadnezzar didn't want this, but he was, he was led into this by the people that were against Daniel. But Daniel, even though he was threatened, he prayed passionately. 
he opened his windows and three days, oh, three times a day, he prayed fervently. He paid, prayed passionately. Come on, these were not little weak prayers. These were prayers that people heard him. They caught him. They saw what he was doing. He was unashamed of the prayers that he was praying. You know, the wicked flee when no man pursue, but the righteous are bold as a lion. Roar! They release a lion. Lion. And guess what God is looking for you to do? To release a roar like a lion, South Africa. He's looking for you to begin to roar through prayer. He's looking for you to bowl. Come to the boiling point. Come to that place of fervency. And even as he did, he was thrown in jail. In fact, he was thrown into a den of lions. But you know what? God was with him. And because God was with him and he was a man of prayer, even in a place that he would normally have been torn asunder, ripped apart and ate by those lions. He called those lions together and he made him a big old bed. This is my imagination. And he laid back on top of those lions, had a comfortable night's sleep. You talk instead of a downfield quilt, he had a lion filled quilt. He laid back on them. The Lord shut the mouth of the lions. And the next day, Nebuchadnezzar went down and he said, was your God able to deliver you? And he said, yes, O king, my God was able. And he came out and the laws of the land were changed. And those people that threw him in, into the lions, they were thrown in and they were eight. And then Daniel's God became the people's God. This is what happens when you pray boldly. This is what happens when you don't peacefully coexist with what's going on around you. You know, I know there are farmers that their lives are being threatened and they're being killed in your land. There's all kinds of stuff that's taking place. There's all types of riots in America going on and people being shot and people being killed and things that are happening. We're not going to change this world with weak, little, uh, limp-wristed, uh, little milk toast prayers. It's going to take fervent, red hot to the boiling point prayers in our lives. If we'll do that, we will make a difference. We will be able to heat things up, baby. We'll not only burn people. We'll not be those people that just pray in tongues on Sunday and cuss on Monday or Tuesday, but we'll be a people that our lives will move generations and nations into full-blown awakening. Our family, our sphere of influence, our, our city, our nation, and the world will be moved into full-blown awakening through the prayers of the saints. It'll be through us. Johannesburg will be saved through us. Kempton Park will be saved through us, through our fervent prayers, bringing people into the presence of God. See, they need his presence if they're going to have his presence, we have to be a people of prayer. A people of prayer are a people of his presence. And a people of his presence are a people of power. Hallelujah. When we live that life of prayer, it releases the power of prayer and people's lives are changed. God wants you. He wants you to enlist in this army of awakening. He wants you to awake Kempton Park, to awake Joburg. He wants you to awake South Africa. He wants you to awake Orlando. He wants you to awake Dallas. He wants you to awake America. He wants you to awake the world, the UK, Asia, all over the world. He wants you to awake the world. How are you going to do it? Through the effectual fervent prayer of the righteous. He said, I'll meet you on the corner of worship and intercession. He said, I'll meet you in that encounter at the intersection of intercession. It's when there's an intense intercession, when there's a fervent prayer life, a passionate prayer life releases power. Let me pray for you. And I want you to pray with me right now. Lift your hands right where you're at in the sanctuary, in your home, wherever you're at. If you're on the side of the road, listening uh, on your phone, just lift your hands and ask the Lord to release a new level of fervency in your life. Father, I thank you for your people. I come in agreement with them right now for a new dimension, a new level, a new fervency, a new passion in their prayer life. 
I touch and agree with you, my brother, my sister, in the name of Jesus, that just like this kettle is heated up to 212 Fahrenheit, 100 Celsius, that you and your prayer life, you're going to 100. You're going to 212. And just like that steam engine on that locomotive, you're going to begin to move forward faster and faster with apostolic acceleration, with prophetic precision. You're going to lead your family, your city, your nation and the nations to the glory of God, even through this passionate prayer life. Decree this for me. Say, I declare and I decree that I am Moving forward in the power of prayer. Say, I decree and I declare that passionate prayer is my portion. I declare and I decree that the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man will avail much. That my prayer that my prayers will begin to be like incense that will arise before the throne. Say this with me. I declare and I decree that there is tremendous power released through my passionate, heartfelt prayer in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. I pray that this word has blessed you today. Next week, you don't want to miss Pastor Greg from our church in South Africa in Johannesburg. He's going to be coming to you from Awake Joburg, from Awake SA, from Legacy there. He's going to be releasing a now word for you and for all of our churches and family and friends in Awake, in Awake Orlando, Awake Florida, all around the world, Awake Dallas. We And all of our friends, you need to tune in next week to hear Pastor Greg, as he comes to you with a word from the Lord. Until this time next week, you be blessed to be a blessing.